today I'm going to be doing a recap of Magnolia Parks and Daisy Hates, the first two books in the Magnolia Parks series because they take place at the same time. So we'll be bouncing back and forth between the girlies. This is actually the second video in this series, so if you want to start from the beginning, You'll have to go watch the first video. Let's first like recap where we are. We are going to start with Miss Magnolia. We'll jump in to a Daisy later. But we're going to start with Miss Magnolia first. So last we saw Magnolia and BJ were almost on again. They were like almost back together. Um, but then Magnolia went to the club, found BJ with a girl giving him a, a quick little lap dance. And she obviously got upset and she wound up while she was upset in the corner. Who should walk over but Tom England, the most eligible bachelor in all of London, longtime crush of Magnolia. And he said, I have a great idea. What if we fake dated each other? I think it could work out for the both of us. We start with the next day. After this um, whole event occurred, we zoom in to Mr. BJ Ballantine's head. And we're at the Parkland house. BJ wakes up. He has a mysterious girl in his bed. Happens a lot. He's like, hey, girly. And he goes downstairs and Henry and Joe are like, Oh my gosh, we're so sorry. But it really seems like Magnolia is dating Tom England now. We did see them kiss at the club last night and then they left together. Sorry. And BJ like immediately freaks out because this is not the first guy, obviously, that BJ that Magnolia has dated post BJ. But this is like the first guy that he's ever been worried about because um he knows that Magnolia has had a crush on Tom England since she was little. Like he is like the coolest guy in all the town. BJ's like, oh no, if Magnolia is gonna ditch me for someone, it's gonna be for Tom England. And Joe's like, it's probably fine. You just like need to go apologize to her, smooth things over. You guys have been through worse. Like it will be okay. So that's what BJ does. BJ packs it up, goes over to Magnolia's house to apologize for what happened last night and to be like, don't date Tom England. She, he lets himself in. He goes upstairs to Magnolia's bedroom and he's like, hey, that's so funny, crazy, silly what happened last night. Sorry about my part in it, but you're not really dating Tom England. And she's like, no, I'm definitely dating Tom England now. Like Tom England and I are definitely a thing. Thank you so much for asking, BJ. That's definitely what ha what's happening. But BJ notices she's still wearing his signet ring which is an important article, an important item. This is what he says about the signet ring. We've had each other's family signet rings since we were rugrats. I gave her mine the day I graduated Varley. Something to remember me by, I think I said, or some shit like that. It's funny to think back now. I was definitely just marking my territory, but she wore it everywhere, never took it off. That same Christmas, she gave me her family's ring. I remember opening it, glancing up at her. She could have given me a chocolate orange and I would have thought it was the greatest present in the world. But her ring that she had to ask her dad for, it was so weighty. You asking me to marry you, Parks? I squinted down at her playfully. Not yet, she smiled. One day I asked Brows up. Girls don't ask, she frowned, offended. But I could. Me. You could, she nodded, resolute. I will, I nodded coolly. She never gave it back, not even after I cheated on her. Took it off her finger. Now she wears it on an extra long chain around her neck that no one can see. But I know it's there see it sometimes before she darts into the shower so he's like okay you can be with tom england but like i know your heart still belongs to me and he is kind of like jabbing at her in that like in that kind of vein and things start to get a little heated they start bickering a little bit and magnolia is like i like want you to remember how terrible it felt to know that you cheated on me it like felt so so terrible and i don't think you've like recognized that and then he she's like i actually would like you to to leave and Bridget hears them, Bridget being Magnolia's sister, Bridget hears them fighting. He come, she comes in and she's like, BJ, you gotta go. She asked you to leave, so you gotta go. Bridget gives him a little lecture on the way out the door about, like, this little phase where you're sleeping with anything that moves is getting a little old. Like, maybe we can move past this. And maybe you also, you could go to therapy. Okay? Like, I think you need a buddy. Bridget is always really trying to, like, be like, I think a little therapy could help everyone in this group. Particularly BJ and Magnolia. A few days later, Magnolia and BJ have yet to mend things. They've not been speaking to each other. And Magnolia goes downstairs for breakfast. And everyone's there. Magnolia is there. Her sister is there. Both her parents are there. Marshley's there. And then their next door neighbor, Sullivan, is there. And Sullivan is this, like, cute little, like, 14-year-old that they're, like, babysitting, apparently, because her parents are out of town for an emergency. Um, they're just, like, chatting. And Harley turns to Magnolia and he's like, hey, could you show my friend's son around town? And Magnolia's like, um, I cannot. I cannot. Because, actually, um, I'm dating someone, so I don't think it would be appropriate. My boyfriend, Tom England, probably wouldn't appreciate that. And everyone's like, whoa, you're dating Tom England. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And Ari, her mom, is immediately like, but what about BJ? Can't be dating Tom because, like, BJ? And... 
Ben Sullivan, the neighbor, is like, are you and BJ fighting? And the whole table is like, girl, you're a guest in this house. You can't just be asking whether BJ and Magnolia are fighting. Like, you're not, you haven't been here for the lore. You haven't been here for the tea. You can't just, like, show up and expect to be told things. And Magnolia Parks is, like, a little suspicious of this. Because, like, why is she asking these sorts of prank questions? Again, this is rude. And Sullivan goes on to explain that Loose Lips is running a contest and the best piece of gossip will win a Chanel num a Chanel 19 flat bag and the multicolor hound's tooth. And she's like, obviously I need to win that. And Magnolia's like, I have to respect a girl going after a purse. Like, who am I to stand between a girl and a purse? Like, honestly, it would be charity for me to, like, reveal a little nugget of gossip to this girly so she can get a Chanel bag and would be helping her out, essentially. And so she says to Sullivan, she said, he cheated on me. That's why we're fighting. That's where we broke up. Like, it was a long time ago, but that's what caused the initial breakup. Immediately she regrets it. She's like, oop, that was maybe I overreacted a little bit on that one. Um, but it's too late. It's too late. She's already said it. It's already out. That same night, or maybe the next day, BJ is at the club with Joe, Christian, and Daisy. And they're at Joe's club, the Hampton House, where everyone just dress like, dresses like they're from the Hamptons. Gorgeous. We love it. And BJ is, like, at the club with some random girl, as he does. When his Insta, he, like, opens his Instagram, he's, like, scrolling through his Instagram, and he realizes his DMs are blowing up. And his, like, comments are just filled with the rat emoji. And he goes, hmm, what's going on? And so he Googles himself to find out what is going on and the cheating post like the news of the cheating post pops up on the screen and he's like oh no he like feels physically ill he's like I might faint I might actually pass away right here at this table and Daisy's there and Daisy as you know is a doctor in training she comes over she takes his pulse and she's like um hey Christian does BJ have panic attacks because his heart rate is at like 150 beats per minute and he's just sitting here so like is he okay? Should we take him to the hospital? And they're, they're trying to talk through all the possible people that could have leaked this news. And the list is not that long. Like, it could have been one of the boys, but, like, BJ doubts it. And it could be Perry or Paley or Bridge, but, like, that's pretty much it. And he's, like, pretty sure that none of those guys would have leaked it. And he's, like, going through all this. And then Daisy goes, it was probably her. Like, have you done anything to piss her off lately? And Jonah's, like, <laughs> yes, he has. He has indeed. And BJ's, like, oh, you know what? Maybe she did do it, actually. After all, that actually does check out. That makes a lot of sense. And then we jump ahead a few days, I think, and Magnolia and Tom are out on a little shopping date. They're being spotted. They're being seen. They've got to do their, like, fake dating duties. And Tom's like, I need a whole new wardrobe, Miss Magnolia. Can you help me pick things out? Because all of my stuff is at Sam, my dead brother's house, and I can't go back there. Like, that feels mm, less good. So if we could pick out all new clothes for me, that would be awesome they shop and they get very flirty they're like kissing for the cameras magnolia like explains that like bj can get a little possessive and like a little mm, angry and he has he's a, he gets he likes to fight people okay if you kiss magnolia the chances of you getting punched in the face are like you know pretty high and tom is like worth it and kisses her in front of the cameras anyway and we're already seeing this like blurring of like what is for the cameras and what is just for fun for them like magnolia is really enjoying this fake dating relationship more than any of these other like fake relationships she's been in the time since she's been with bj like tom england is a catch turns out he's a fun guy he's a catch the next day, Magnolia is out to lunch with Paley. They go to the same place for lunch every single Tuesday. And so she's out to lunch and then she happens to run into BJ. BJ obviously intentionally picked this place to go with Jonah because he knew Magnolia was going to be here. He goes to Magnolia and he's like, hey, girly, um, did you leak the fact that I cheated on you to the press? And Magnolia's like, no, but I might know a certain 15 year old who really did need a Chanel bag and she might have done it. I might have mentioned it to a 15-year-old who might have leaked it to the press. And BJ's like, you don't understand how much this has messed up my life. Literally, everyone hates me. My mother isn't speaking to me. Neither uh, are um, two out of my three sisters. So, four sisters? How many sisters does BJ have? At least three, maybe four. We can never know. There's no way for us to find out. But Magnolia is, like, not apologetic at all. <laughs> and she, like, is, is standing by it. But BJ notices she still has, like, the chain of the signet ring. And so he's comforted by the fact that, like, clearly she hasn't moved on from him entirely because, like, she still has this ring on. And then the next day, it's a full box set dinner. And it's the first, like, full box set event that Magnolia is bringing Tom to. So it's, like, a big deal. She's, like, a little nervous to introduce Tom to all of her friends. And they arrive, like, 15 minutes late because Magnolia does want all eyes on her. And everyone does immediately turn and look at her when she walks in the room, except BJ, who, like, very intentionally, like, looks away. He's like, I'm not even looking at you at all. Obviously, like, this is all strategy. All these two do is think about each other in every single moment. 
every single moment BJ is thinking about Magnolia, Magnolia is thinking about BJ. Okay? It's just the truth of things. Tom is very charming. He's charming everyone. He's having a great time. He's like fitting in with the friend group like fairly well. Obviously this upsets BJ. Tom is explaining like kind of how like Magnolia and um, her, Tom and Magnolia ended up together. He's like explaining the course of events that led them to be like dating each other. And he is like, oh, I've always had a little bit of a crush on her, honestly. And BJ goes, <clears throat> but you're 30 and she's 22. BJ pipes up. So when you were 23 and she was 15, you were keen on her? Shut up, Henry whispers, looking embarrassed. No, BJ shrugs innocently. I'm just saying, it's a little bit weird. <laughs> BJ's like, how long could you have had a crush on her? Hmm? You're, like, significantly older than her, so, like, if you've had a crush on her for more than, like, a year, honestly, it's a little creepy. Honestly, it might even be creepy now. I decided this is, ooh, not giving me the best vibes, Mr. Tom. Just saying. And honestly, I have to love BJ for that. I have to. And then Magnolia, they, like, move on. <laughs> They're able to divert the conversation away from BJ. And Magnolia explains how, like, the friend came, the friend group co coalesced and how they became, like, family at Barley. And they, she tells the story of how her parents forgot her 16th birthday. They just, like, completely forgot it. And so to celebrate it, the friend group grabbed Magnolia and they took her on a private jet and they all flew to Paris and um, in the Hemez plane and they celebrated her birthday together. Like, they became her family it's so, not like how like these people around her like raised her they were her family like they were the ones who like taught her things and like made her the person she is today it's like the people that are at this table with her and it's very sweet okay time to check in on the hates oh, my little loves what has happened in daisy before we catch up here um big things that have happened with daisy daisy and christian are like on again off again are they casual are they serious they're both starting to develop feelings for each other but neither is like w really willing to admit it and then we also have julian who is dealing with this man named ezra brown who is causing trouble okay ezra brown is this guy who wants julian to steal a painting for him pretty standard stuff but he gives weird vibes and we'll spend some more time talking about Ezra Brown in this section. That's kind of the 411 of what's been happening with Daisy and the gang. We jump in with Christian, who's actually just returned from a trip to Prague. He went to Prague with the boys after that, like, weird full box at dinner. They, like, needed to, like, reset themselves because the dinner with Tom was weird. He gets back and the only thing he wants to do is go to Daisy's house. In fact, he says, I'm thinking about all the other girls who messaged me today. All the invitations to go to other houses and other dinners and not one offer sounds better to me than trying to pick a fight with Daisy Hates. And so he says, that is indeed what I'm going to do. And so he shows up in Daisy's room and he immediately starts bragging about all the girls he slept with in Prague. He was like, I was so busy in Prague. I slept with the hottest girls and now I'm back. And Daisy's like, why are you telling me this? <laughs> Like, why? Like, I understand we're not exclusive, but, like, what? That's, like, weird behavior. And Christian's like, we're just friends. We're just bros. You know, like, I would, I would tell my bros about this, so I'm telling you about it because we're friends and pals. And Daisy's like, okay, then, friends. I will go to Italy this weekend and sleep with someone hot. Okay, get out of my room. And then Daisy has to convince everyone that it's time to go to their Lake Como house. I think if I were at the hates Lake Como house, I don't think I could be unhappy. They're, like, out here murdering people, and I just feel as though every single problem I've ever had in my entire life would be solved. I've never been to Lake Como, and I desperately need to get there, because I just truly believe that if I was sitting with a, a iced, with a little cocktail in my hand near that lake, literally every single problem in my life would be solved. I don't think I could be unhappy. So just picture me in the corner in all these scenes. They're, like, murdering people by the pool. I'm just laying out and getting some sun. I just really wish I was in Lake Como right now. Anyway, they go to Lake Como, Daisy's going, Julian's going, Romeo is going, and then all the Lost Boys are going. Um, this house is this gorgeous house that was bought by their grandfather in the 1970s, and it's done up in this, like, very classic Italian Renaissance style. There are ten, <laughs> there are ten bedrooms, it's right on the lake, so there's, like, a dock, there's a pool, it's, like, so gorgeous and stunning. We get there, they arrive, and they realize there's not enough bedrooms for everyone. They have, like, a lot of people there, and there's not enough bedrooms for everyone to get their own bedroom. And so Daisy and Romeo have to share. They have to. They always shared growing up because they were dating. <laughs> and now they're going to share again, even though they're not dating. But the vibes are, like, immediately flirty. Like, immediately they're falling back into those old flirty patterns. And we can tell that Romeo desperately wants Daisy back. 
Like, he desperately wants Stacy back. Like, honestly, Christian should take some notes. Every time I read this book, I think this is my third time through Daisy Hates, every time I read it, I like Romeo a little bit more. I'm like, actually, Romeo is the only one in this whole series who gives Daisy the flowers she deserves. Did he sleep with another girl in her bed? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's not great. That's not great. Um, wish he didn't do that. But, like, he's obsessed with her in the way that she deserves to have someone be obsessed with her. Christian, trash garbage. We also get some insight from Julian about, like, why he doesn't date. And he talks about the fact that he doesn't date, but it's not because he, like, is a commitment phobe or he, like, can't do commitment. Like, he's like, no, I'm incredibly loyal. Like, I am loyal AF. But he tells the story of, like, what happened to Daisy after their parents' death. So we talked about how their parents were, like, killed in front of them when Daisy was about eight. And in the, like, months afterwards, Daisy, like, literally would not leave Julian's side. Like, she slept in his bed. She, like, would wait outside the bathroom while he showered. Like, would sit in his lap while they were eating. Like, needed to be, like, literally, like, physically touching Julian at all times. She, like, didn't talk either. But eventually through like lots of therapy they were able to like get her better and he says it was a lengthy process hardest thing i've ever done probably the most most worthwhile though and once again this is why julian is the best character in this whole series like the best top tier his relationship with daisy is the best one in this book both books okay i love bj magnolia but like daisy julian the brother sister bond would die for them would simply step in front of a moving train for them and he goes on to talk about how daisy is like his weak spot and there's like nothing he can do about it but he like loves her so much and like everyone knows it and that's why they had to break up Romeo and Daisy because it became too dangerous for them to be together we like get that explained again and it's why Julian doesn't date because he knows if he were to love someone else in a, like any similar capacity to the, the way he loves Daisy it would just be like another weak spot like he already feels like so vulnerable with having like Daisy out in the world and with the like level of care he takes to make sure that she is safe and like how that is his top priority and like needs to be and like if he were to invite someone else into his life and have to do that with her would that put daisy in danger and also it would it would definitely put this new girl in danger too oh we love julian <laughs> meanwhile christian's back in london christian's back in london and he's in a bad mood he's out with christian with henry joe and tara Sachs, and he's in a bad mood they show up at this restaurant it's an italian restaurant and christian's like i hate italian food i actually hate the whole country of italy i think it's overrated i think it's a really bad time and why does everyone love italian food actually italy sucks and everyone's like, what? what? Henry's like, what are you doing? What are you saying? And then Tara <laughs> steps in and is like, is your girlfriend in Italy without you? She like immediately catches on to what is going on. And Christian's like, she's not my girlfriend. She's not my girlfriend. And Henry's like, okay, cool. cool. Then go kiss someone. And Christian's like, I'm not going to just go up to a girl and like kiss someone. And Henry's like, kiss Tara then. And Tara's like, yeah, that's fine. You can kiss me. If you're not in, if you're not like in love with Daisy, and Christian is like, I can't. And then he like, this is like a eureka moment. Like the light bulb finally goes off above his little head. And he goes, oh my gosh, I am in love with Daisy. I have feelings for her. <laughs> Embarrassing. This scene also is like serves as one of our earlier introductions to the love triangle between Henry, Joe, and Tara. Jessa Hastings really spends a lot of time in all the books trying to make me care about this love triangle between Sar Tara Sachs, Jonah, and Henry. And I just can't because I love Henry and Jonah so much like as individuals. And I just like... I can't wish ill upon either of them, and I just don't care. I love them so much. I both I want both of them to have a lovely little love interest, but I just can't bring myself to care about Tara Sachs. Sorry. Meanwhile, back in Lake Como, Daisy is also out in the town. She's out with Romeo, the Lost Boys, and Julian, and they're at one of the Brambillo, Bram Brillo's bars in Lake Como. And we get some reflections, and Daisy and Romeo have, like, fallen back into their usual patterns. They're, like, touching, but not together, is what it's explained as. And Daisy talks about just growing up with Romeo and how they were, like, kids together, and they were kids that were living in the shadow of this, like, dark, dark life, and they were often, like, hiding in closets and overhearing conversations they shouldn't have heard or, like, finding things they shouldn't have found, like that in closets and things and just like going through that experience with Romeo and how that really bonded them together because they became each other's like safe space and she's kind of thinking about how like nice it feels to be like back in that rhythm when who should arrive at the bar but Daisy hates his enemy Tavi Jukes and if we recall Romeo cheated with Tavi Jukes in Daisy hates his bed oh it also turns out that he slept with Tavi Jukes right before he got back from New York yeah it wasn't just that one time years ago in daisy's bed it also happened again recently and like obviously daisy and him weren't together at the time but like romeo 
my sweet friend. I'm like trying to ride for you. I'm trying to say, Romeo is so obsessed with Daisy. He's the only one who deserves her. But like, you've got to make some better choices. You've got to make some better choices. And Daisy immediately ditches Romeo after this comes up. And she comes up to Julian and the boys and like goes and sits down on Booker's lap. And Julian's like, you can't kiss him. And Daisy's like, um, actually, you can't tell me who I'm allowed to kiss. And Julian says, yes, but I am going to tell him who he's allowed to kiss. Because he is my employee. So, um, Booker, don't kiss her tonight. And so she's like, fine. And she gets up and she goes over to the bar. And a guy immediately approaches her and, like, asks what happened with Romeo. And if he's her boyfriend. And Daisy's like, no, he's my ex. And, like, he's my ex. And that's his ex. So... And she, he's like, oh my gosh, that seems messy. And they like drink together and then he buys her another drink. And when they go to cheers it, he puts something in her drink. He does. He tries to drug her. And Daisy's like, if I hadn't been trying to avoid being poisoned my whole life, probably wouldn't have noticed. But I have been trying to avoid being poisoned my whole life. So I did, in fact, notice. And she's like, you put something in my drink. And he's like, what? What are you talking about? And then she kicks his stool out from underneath him, slams his head into the bar. And Julian's immediately at her side and is like, what the heck just happened? Daisy's like, he put something in my drink. And she like realizes almost immediately that this man will not live through the night. Like you don't try to drug Daisy hates and live to tell the tale. You don't. Sorry. The guy's like, no, she's crazy. I didn't put anything in her drink. He's like trying to deny it. But like, Julian's literally never going to believe you, man. And a big fight breaks out in the bar, and Daisy's evacuated. Miguel, they shove her into a car with Miguel. She's driven home. She's taken away. And she knows that the, the boys are going to kill the guy tonight. And she's waiting up for them to get back just to make sure everyone's safe. You know, everyone made it home safely. Julian comes back, but you know who isn't with him. Um, that's right. Romeo doesn't come back with him. And Daisy's like, where where is Romeo? And Julian's like, well, he decided to drive Tavi home. Daisy is annoyed by this. When Rome gets home, he like swears that nothing happened. It was like she just needed a ride home. He wanted to make sure she got home safely, but like nothing happened. No funny business. And then Daisy decides to believe him. She kisses him. They wind up sleeping together. And I have to ask myself, am I Team Romeo now? And the answer is not no. We haven't seen Tiller in a second. Again, in my heart of hearts, I'm a Tiller fan. At some point, Julian has another meeting with Ezra Brown. Like I said before, Ezra Brown, bad news. He gives off the baddest vibes. And they're having a second meeting because Julian has, like, decided mostly that he's going to accept this job from Ezra. Julian's done his research. He has some dirt on Ezra. He knows that the mistress that Ezra's trying to steal this painting for is Stavros's daughter. And Stavros is this, like, Greek crime boss. So, again, just part of the, like, criminal underbelly of the UK. And I guess Greece. And the vibes are still off, and Julian, like, raises the price, asks for a down payment, and um, agrees to steal a piece from him. So, like, it's a go. The project, the plan, is a go. And Daisy's back home now. We've returned back to the compound. We've left Italy. Everyone's sad. I'm actually still there. They left me there because I refused to leave. I, like, um, hid in one of the closets until everyone left, and then I came out. And now I live there in the Lake Como house, and that's where you'll find me for the rest of my days. Anyway, <laughs> Daisy's back home, though, and she's feeling a little, like, tangled up in her feelings after spending the week with Romeo at, in, like, come out and, like, sleeping with him. My favorite, yeah, we're gonna call it, like, a literary device that Jessa uses in this novel, in these two novels, actually, is the, the mirroring between Magnolia and BJ and Daisy and Romeo, because they're, like, externally, their circumstances are so intensely similar. Like, they are both these, like, childhood loves that lasted for years and years and years until a cheating thing happened. They've both through, been through a lot of trauma together. Honestly, Daisy and Romeo maybe more than, I don't know, it's arguable. They've both been through a lot of, like, traumatic events together, and they're both broken up when we start the book, and there is this sense of, like, will they or won't they, but I feel like there is also such, like, a difference. There is such a, like, faded inevitability that, like, I feel like happens with Magnolia and BJ, where there was never a second that I doubted, like, literally not one second, that I doubted that Magnolia and BJ were going to end up together. Like, she dates other people, as we'll talk about in this video, she, like, gets with Tom very seriously, but, like, I was always like, oh, BJ's gonna pull it out in the end. I don't think Daisy's gonna end up with Rome. And maybe it's just because, like, Rome doesn't have a peel of each in this book. Like, this is Magnolia and BJ, and, like, this is Daisy and the crew. Also because Daisy's thoughts don't revolve around anyone solely. Like, she's not thinking about Romeo anywhere close to as much as Magnolia is thinking about BJ. But I just think they're such interesting mirrors of each other, and it, like, highlights their differences even more. Daisy is in a weird headspace when Christian shows up at her house. 
he immediately shows up and asks about how Italy was. And Daisy was like, you know, it was nice. We played sticky fingers. And <laughs> this is my favorite. I love it. Sticky Fingers. Oh my gosh. Sticky Fingers is this game that Daisy and Romeo actually invented when they were kids. And it is like the floor meets, the floor is lava meets just robbery. And they'll take like items and they'll hide them all over the house in these like crazy spots. And then they'll compete to like steal them back, but they can't touch the ground. And it like it involves like a lot of acrobatics and like Daisy getting like th thrown on things. And her and Romeo are the best at it. They're like the best duo at Sticky Fingers. And I love it. They play it a couple times throughout the series. And every time I'm delighted by it. I'm delighted by Sticky Fingers. So she explains that like they did that and they like hung out by the pool and like whatever. And Christian's like, anything eventful happen? And Daisy's like, oh, you heard that I almost got dropped. Like, obviously, that's what you're bringing this up. Yeah, but it's not a big deal. And Christian was like, no, what? <laughs> that's crazy. And Daisy's like, I mean, it's really not that big of a deal. Like, the boys took care of it. Like, not, he's not an issue anymore. Don't even worry. He's not in this mortal, mortal plane. Christian's like, whoa, um, okay. And she's like, I mean, like, it was a little, like, troubling. But, like, more traumatic stuff has happened to me. And he's like, okay, um, anything else that will happen? Like, for example, did you f*** Romeo? <laughs> and Daisy's like, um, and she like pauses for a second. We like actually spend a lot of time in her thoughts being like, why is he asking this very pointed question? And like, does he care? And like, why does he care? And she goes, yeah, I did. And he's like, okay, cool, cool, cool. Cool. That's not even a big deal at all. Whatever. I don't even really care. I don't know why I asked that question, honestly. I'm actually just taking a survey of everyone over the weekend and asking who did sleep with Romeo. So thank you for participating in the survey. <laughs> Daisy's like, why are you being weird? Are you jealous of the fact that I just slept with him over the weekend? And Christian's like, literally no. Like, literally no. Remember when I slept with the hottest girl in Prague? So why would I care? Daisy's like, yeah, I know. I assumed you were sleeping with other people. Like, while I was gone, I assumed you would be sleeping with other people. And Christian's like, why would you assume that? And Daisy's like, L because you are sleeping with other people. I feel like you're gaslighting me right now a little bit. And Christian's like, don't call me a slut when you were the one sleeping with your ex-boyfriend at Lake Como. And Daisy's like, mm, are you calling me a slut? And Christian's like, no, 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 no. I was just kidding about all that, actually. Sorry, that got a little out of hand, but like, no. And Daisy's like, get out of my room. <laughs> like, get out. Christian's like, you can't just kick me out every time you get annoyed with me. And she's like, yeah, I can't get out. I'll call my security. Get out. And he does leave. And the next morning he wakes up and he's in a cranky mood and Magnolia and Henry are over at the house and Christian is a little mean to Magnolia and then Henry's like hey don't be mean to Magnolia and then he takes her out to lunch that was not an important plot point but I told you about it anyway meanwhile Daisy is on a little field trip field trip to the Louvre with the hates so Daisy Julian the boys in Romeo are all headed to the Louvre headed to Paris for a little trip to trick Interpol I love how this chapter opens, so I'm going to read it too. In another life, I'm an art historian, a professor of art history, or maybe a conservator of artworks, but this is where I'd be, surrounded by beautiful things, things that inspire you and move the world forward and speak to what it means to be human. There would be nothing bad, no one would be dying, and if they were, it'd be two-dimensional. There would be no blood, just red paint. And she talks a lot about how art is her and Julian's, like, shared interest. She, like, talks about how, like, they always have like some interest outside of like crime and her dad like loved cooking and that's where she like learned her love of cooking was from him but like Julian and hers shared interest has always been art and it's she's like it's Julian's real passion she's like and she says I think the the way he loves it is why I love it how I love it like the only reason she loves art as much as she does is because Julian loves it the way he does <laughs> and she's thinking about Christian now Christian's in Greece with Magnolia and Daisy is kind of sad about it but like is still sleeping with Rob so she can't be that sad she's like well I am still sleeping with my ex-boyfriend too can't be that sad over it she's just like mulling this over and she's talking with Miguel about it Miguel her bodyguard and also her confidant and she's like yeah I mean like I don't know if I can be with Christian and right now I'm with Realm and Miguel's like Romeo has hurt you too and Daisy's like yeah but Christian is hurting me now the hurt that Romeo causes in the past, Christian's hurt is in the present. Anyway, they get into the Louvre and they are able to get inside the Louvre because of with Soleil Cousinier. Did I pronounce that wrong? Almost certainly. Who Julian definitely had a thing with in the past. She's this like very like cool, sexy Parisian art curator. Julian and her had like a little bit of a thing. And so he helps, she helps them get into the Louvre because like as art thieves, like should you be able to just like stroll into any art museum? You would think not, but like she's helping them out. And they are planning on convincing Interpol that they are casing Vermeer's The Lace Maker. And so they're like going over to that painting and looking at it, hanging out. Um, but Daisy also has some other paintings she likes to look at when she comes to the Louvre. 
One of Daisy's favorites is The Virgin with Child and St. Anne, and she she finds this one fascinating because the lamb and the baby Jesus are, like, wrestling each other while the adults, like, look on so, like, peacefully. With, it's, like, an allegory for, like, the, the knowledge of this, like, baby of, like, what is to come and that, like, you know, Christmas leads to Easter and, like, it doesn't end nicely for Jesus in the story and that the adults are like aware of this like they know what is coming but they seem to be so at peace with it and she finds that very odd and then she goes to her favorite painting which is Intervention of the Sabian Woman which is this like big painting where this woman is standing between like two opposing armies one led by her husband and one led by her father I believe well, like, her children, like, clamber around her ankles. And Daisy just feels so connected to this woman. And the fact that she's always surrounded by all this violence. And she hopes that one day she can, like, put a stop to it. There's this sense of, like, real hope with this woman. And this message of, like, love winning in a situation where she's able to, like, halt this epic battle between people that love her. Like, two forces that love her um, are fighting each other. And she's able to, like, halt them in between. Is this going to come up later in the series? I don't know. I feel like it might. I feel like maybe we're going to have a war between, like, the Hemezes and the Hates. I don't know. That hasn't happened yet. That's not a spoiler. This is just me theorizing. Mm, the Hemezes and the Hates. The Brambillos and the Hates. Tiller? The police and the Hates? <laughs> I don't think that would count. Anyway, who should arrive then but... Tills, who Daisy has been there to distract via flirting. And she, like, asks about his breakup, and she's like, oh my gosh, we're taking our relationship international now. We're going on these cute little international dates. And they're just, like, flirty, flirty vibes. Because Daisy is there, actually, to distract Tiller. Tiller is there to collect information on his investigation into Julian. Because, again, his investigation plan is just to follow them around and then flirt with Daisy. Tiller, bless his little heart, is bad at his job. And we love him for it. They're very cute. It's very sweet. Pause. We're going to do a quick update to the timeline. We have one. We are going to continue the little line of Tom England and Magnolia Parks dating. They're like fake dating, but they're like real flirty. I don't know. We're going to put it on there as a relationship between these two. And then we are also going to pop on the Lake Como trip as like the start of Daisy and Romeo being back together, sort of. I don't like really know how to put Daisy. Yeah, we're going to put Daisy and Rome back together, sort of. But she's also still kind of sort of with Christian. There, She's on and off again with both of them. She's seen them casually. Um, and then we will also be plopping, because we're about to jump into it, the Greece trip for Magnolia and the Crow. Okay? Because Magnolia, BJ, Christian, all of them, like we mentioned, they are about to head to Greece. And we are about to jump into this. And this is one of the, like, the juiciest sections of the book. It contains my favorite passage from the series. We're going back in time, quite a bit actually, to when, to a couple weeks ago, when Tom was out of town leaving BJ and Magnolia up to their own devices, obviously. And BJ is waiting for, Mac BJ knows that Tom is out of town. He had Henry like verify the fact that Tom is truly out of town. And he's waiting outside of Magnolia's office to take her out. And she's like, oh, my car is already here. And he's like, uh, just send it home. Like, do you really care? And she's like, no. And they get in his car and they're sitting in the back and BJ's like, do you need a reset? And a reset is this thing they do where they like just stare at each other in the eyeballs. They don't talk. They just like stare at each other. Don't blink. And Magnolia will pick how long they need to stare at each other based on like how much of a reset they need. And Magnolia picks 15 seconds this time, which is the longest they've ever needed. Most of the time they only need up to 12. But apparently Magnolia saw this one time on Oprah. That's what we're told. And BJ's like, I don't know. I just like staring at her. And they stared at each other's eyes for 15 seconds. And BJ, we're in BJ's head for this. BJ spends the whole time just thinking about how beautiful she is and how lucky he is to have gotten to love her and just like how stunning and gorgeous and amazing she is and how like devastating it is that they're not together in this moment. And then he spends the night at her house in a purely platonic friendly way, obviously, in her bed. He's sleeping in her bed. And then it continues that he stays in her bed the whole time Tom is out of town. And they mostly just stay in and lay in bed and watch documentaries together either in bed together or they go down to the home theater but they have to sit in the same chair and Magnolia will make up some excuse why they have to sit in the same chair every time she's like um we can't sit in that chair because it just got reupholstered or she's like there's a bee in that chair you can't sit in it you have to sit in the like big chair with me because she needs to snuggle with him and then we were told the story of their, like, first time together, which is this, like, really big deal. BJ wanted to make it really special, and he booked them a room at the Mandarin Oriental. And they got up into the room, and they were both really nervous because they were both pretty young. He, Magnolia, like, reflects on this, and she's like, we probably were a little too young for this happening. She says this, we were just babies, really, doing grown-up things with hearts the size of Texas and a lust as deep as the Mariana Trench. We were too young, I think, when I think about it now. 
Bridget says we were, that I transferred my paternal dependency onto him and latched. Hardly my fault, though, is it? I didn't send myself to boarding school at the ripe old age of 11. I didn't ask to have checked out ridiculous parents who preferred yachting over with Jay-Z over weekends at home with me and my sister. What was I supposed to do? Not become disproportionately attached to the world's most perfect boy? Ah, oh, so sweet. And so they get up. They're both really nervous, though. They, like, they have some champagne, and they're playing Uno. They, like, play several rounds of Uno together while they wait for, like, the champagne to kick in and for them to, like, calm down. And... Um, they finally, you know, start their activities and Magnolia is talking the whole time about bees and how bees are dying and she watched this documentary and she's like very concerned about the bees dying and then they spend the rest of the night after they finish like just like snuggled up together watching documentaries about the bees it's like this is why like the bees are so important to their relationship because they're so connected to this this like this moment in time for them and um, <laughs> it's just like so sweet it's like such a sweet moment Magnolia is like reflecting on this and um then while she's like thinking about this and they're snuggled in bed together Tom arrives Tom strolls in and is like oh why is BJ in your bed Magnolia and it is awkward it is indeed awkward and Magnolia is like oh we slept together but we didn't like sleep together like he just had like a sleep over you know and she's like it's not a big deal we literally do it all the time and Tom is like I am shockingly not reassured by the fact that he sleeps in your bed all the time and then they kind of chat about it, and Tom's like, okay, but, like, don't make me look stupid, okay? Don't make me look stupid in this, Magnolia. And Magnolia's like, swear, scouts on her, would never. Later, we have a gala, and BJ was invited to go to the gala with Tara. Tara was like, come with me, and Tara, BJ was like, no, I'm not going to make Magnolia angry. We're so proud of him making a good decision for once. But sometimes he can. Does he make a bad decision by the end of this chapter? Yeah, but we're going to relish this moment where he doesn't go with Tara to this this gala he shows up alone and he immediately spots magnolia and magnolia is on tom's arm and this is clearly like a moment in which they're being seen and it's like very important for them to like keep up their fake dating facade and he's she's just being like shown around and bj is just like watching them and for the first time ever he's like oh i think she might be in a real relationship with tom like i know what magnolia looks like when she's falling for someone i know what she looks like when she's happy and like I think I might be losing her. He's like literally such an overdramatic little drama queen. Tom kisses her, like tips her head back and kisses her. And BJ says it feels like his arm has been lobbed off with a machete. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Our little dramatic boy. And so being BJ and now feeling this like terror of feeling like he's losing Magnolia, he makes the worst possible choice he can. And he says, Jonah, I need some Coke. And Jonah is like, she's going to be so pissed if she finds out about this. You promised her, like, mm, don't make, maybe make a different choice. And BJ's like, I've broken other promises to her. And Joe is like, she will care about this one. Like, this one matters to her. And BJ says, look at her. She's happy. Ugh. And that's enough. Jonah's like, okay, fine. And he's like, okay, no more drinking, though. You do not need to be mixing these two things together. Got it, got it? And BJ says, got it, got it. Goes home, does that, and then goes home with Vanna Ripley. <laughs> and we see some text messages um, from BJ later that night, and he's, like, sloshed. Like, he cannot string a sentence together. He cannot spell a single word. Magnolia seems a little nervous. He apologizes to her via text message a little later that night. But, like, things are messy. Messy, messy. Then we're Zoomed to a few days later when Magnolia is having dinner with the Englands, with, like, Tom and his parents and Clara. Clara being his dead brother's widow and they're at the mandarin they're at the mandarin which like feels like a little bit of a slap in the face to bj because it's like their place it is their place and it has this like really special meaning to bj and magnolia and so to be going to dinner with tom's family at it feels a little magnolia's like feeling a little yuck about this she also tom can't pick her up beforehand so she has to drive herself i mean she doesn't drive herself ew disgusting her chauffeur drives her but like he should have picked her up i like feel like that was very rude we like meet clara for the first time clara this widow of sam and she's only 26 they were like high school sweethearts who got married like incredibly young and like we're just like so in love they had to get married like right out of high school and to know that she's 26 and he's already gone it's just like devastating and magnolia looks at him and is like just like devastated by it like oh it breaks her little heart and she's having dinner with them the england's love magnolia she's like a charm her. they love her and then we get a little fun piece of lore lore drop and that is that magnolia's godfather is elton john <laughs> this like gets brought up like very occasionally and it is so delightful what a what a treat that magnolia's godfather is elton john later that 
during the dinner, Clara and Magnolia end up in the bathroom together at the same time, and um, they wind up like chatting. And Magno and Clara asks about BJ and asks Magnolia what happened between her and BJ. And Magnolia is like, "He cheated on me. Like it's been all over the papers. Haven't you seen?" And Clara immediately starts to tear up, and Magnolia is kind of like flustered. She doesn't know what to do. And Clara explains, "Sorry, you guys just remind me of sick me and Sam, that like young, desperate love." And then Clara says to Magnolia. There are worse things than cheating, you know. And Magnolia says, like, dying. And Clara agrees. And I think this is, like, ooh. This is a moment that rattles Magnolia, like, to her core. Because I think it reminds her a lot of that moment with where BJ almost overdosed. And this moment in which she almost took him back because she realized that. Because she, like, saw that. That, like, a life where she's able to forgive BJ for this oversight. And these oversights over the years. Because she's going to have to forgive, like, a lot of hurt. There's, like, three years of just, like, them hurting each other. And she's also going to have to admit the places where she hurt him. Like, perhaps that is more important than, like, keeping her pride in this situation. Because, like, he could very well die. Like, just as Sam died, like... If, if BJ were to die at 26 in the same way that Sam died at 26, would she ever be able to stop regretting those years she wasted? And yeah, I just think anytime Magnolia is like reminded of death, she has to look at cheating and go like, that isn't the worst. And then shortly after that, we find out why Tom needs a foxhole. Turns out he's actually deeply in love with Clara and um, they kissed like fairly recently. And obviously like it would not be appropriate for him to be like seen with his brother's his like recently deceased brother's wife so he knows he can't be with clara but he's like a little bit in love with her and then magnolia is like kind of like well she doesn't love this news and tom is like does that make you jealous that i kissed her and magnolia is like yes it does but i am possessive in a notoriously bad chair so don't read too much into that but like she's rattled by this as well one because again she's starting to fall for tom just a little bit she like kind of has feelings for tom and is a notoriously bad chair we know this about magnolia she's not super happy unless everyone is in love with her and only her and so then the next day, Magnolia asks BJ to get out of town for a few days. He's like, she's like, hey, are you busy? And BJ is indeed busy. He has definitely like things lined up and he cancels all of them. He will drop literally anything. They could be like, BJ, we need you here at this moment. You will bring world peace to this world if you show up on this time in this date. And Magnolia is like, hey, girly, do you want to come shopping with me at Gucci on that day? He'd be like, sorry, I'm busy. I can't come. Like he would drop anything for this girl. And so he immediately cancels all his plans to spend time with her. And they head to Farnham House. And BJ, like, drives them while they're up there and she's like playing songs from their past and bj just like muses about how much like he loves driving with her and how much he just like loves being with her he loves talking with her like he is just so smitten over her at every moment it's so sweet and they arrive at farnham house and her dad's car is in the parking lot and she's like oh my gosh that's so strange and then she's like oh I forgot I told him about this place because he needed somewhere and I go on like a writing retreat with Post Malone. And BJ's like, awesome, Post Malone is in there with your dad right now. Sick, let's go talk with Posty. Like, that sounds like a great time. And they like walk in and they like get their room key and then they, um, at the bar, they see Harley. And who's with Harley? But Marsley. Marsley being Magnolia's nanny. And so immediately Magnolia walks over there and is like, what the heck is happening? What is going on? And she's devastated. This is not the first time that Harley has cheated. He is, like, literally the worst, and he has cheated, like, multiple times, and Magnolia has, is, like, aware of that. Like, he's not super faithful to his, her mom. But, like, Marsley is this person that, like, has been one of the only, like, parental figures in Magnolia's life has been Marsley, this, like, person she can trust, the person she can turn to. And to have that kind of, like, pulled out from underneath her feels, like, just, like, crushing. Also, Marsley is the one who insisted that Magnolia not go back to BJ, because he cheated she's he she was the one who was like if he cheated once he's gonna cheat again like don't go back to him Mar magnolia and to find out that marcy has been like having an affair with her father for six years that she has been cheating but yet gave this advice to magnolia feels like this utter betrayal and she turns to marcy and says don't you ever speak to me ever again and i really do think and we'll come to kind of unpack this this is mostly about bj like it's mostly about like trusting this woman enough to like, take her advice over staying with BJ. And so BJ obviously gets Magnolia out of there. They go to a hotel together, and Magnolia is devastated. So he takes her to this, like, spa and hotel and is like, what do you need from me? Like, I will give you whatever you need. 
And Magnolia turns to him and says, that night you overdosed. You didn't do that on purpose, did you? And BJ's like, no, like, absolutely not. He's a little confused on why she's bringing this up, but he's like, no, that was, like, an accident. Won't do that again. Pinky promise. Like, th that was bad news. And Magnolia says, was it about me? And then he says, my favorite line in the entire series. Parks, there's not much about me that isn't about you. I just, like, love this line. One, I th do think it's, like, one of the most honest things BJ has ever said. But also just, like, oh, it's so sweet. There's not much about me that isn't about you. And Magnolia is just, like, so devastated that she listened to Marsley and has, like, didn't take BJ back. Because she almost did after that overdose. She almost took him back and um, didn't because Marsley told her not to. She goes home a few days later and she is chatting with Bridget, which who like didn't know the specifics of the affair but was kind of suspicious that something was happening and she also we also find out that Ari Magnolia's mom also probably had some sense that something was happening um and has been like on and off seeing this like French guy and like preparing for an impending divorce but Magnolia was kind of like taken aback from this like Magnolia definitely has like rose-colored tint on the world and will purposely not see things that she doesn't want to and so this is one of those those things and Magnolia's like I don't even know why they got married if they don't even like each other like what the heck are they even doing and Bridget is like um, it was you like they really only got married because Ari got pregnant with Magnolia like that was the the reason that they got married and and then Marsley comes in and wants to chat with Magnolia wants to like you know sort things out she doesn't want to leave on such an angry term and magnolia is like no and immediately the conversation turns to bj and how magnolia is pissed that she that marsley told her to break it off with him and marsley was like it was just some advice like i am not the one controlling what you do with that advice and magnolia is like he nearly died did you know that he nearly died and marsley did not know she had no idea about the overdose and she is like shocked and she kind of like staggers back and magnolia is like get out i hate you like get out of my room i don't want to speak to you and marsley leaves like very distressed and um tom arrives pretty shortly after that and he sees that magnolia is packing and he's like hey she, he has heard like what happened with marsley and um harley but he like doesn't know why she's packing he's like where are you going and magnolia is like i'm gonna go away for a while and tom says am i invited this time and magnolia is like of course you can always come and tom's like is bj coming and magnolia is like well I mean, it was sort of his idea, so it seems like it would be kind of rude to kick him off of the trip at this point, so yes, he will be coming. And then Harley comes in, and he's in a bad mood. He's, like, really upset because news of his cheating scandal has been broken to the press, and he is, like, getting in Magnolia's face about it, and Magnolia's like, I don't know what you're talking about. It wasn't me. I don't know why you would think it was me. Mm -hmm, that's so sad that that happened to you. Oh, I'm so sorry that you cheated, and now people know about it. Mm-hmm. And he's getting, like, really upset. And Tom steps in and is like, whoa, 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 that's enough. Like, we don't need to be yelling at Magnolia that much. And Harley is like, this is my house. Like, be careful how you speak to me in my home. And, like, Tom is like, you want to fight me? And Harley's like, yeah, I'm going to fight you. And then he shoves Tom. Okay, he shoves Tom. Tom kind of just stumbles back, like, takes a step back. And he bumps into Magnolia, who's right behind him. And Magnolia falls over and lands on her side table and, like, smashes a lamp the way she lands. And she slices her hand open. And now she's, like, bleeding. And Harley is, like, flustered. He, like, did not mean to hurt Magnolia in the slightest, but, like, he was yelling. He was being, like, the worst. And Tom is, like, get, like, okay, is your suitcase packed? Let's close it up. Bridget is right there. And they, like, get her out of the house. Tom gets her into his car, and he's, like, where is BJ right now? Like, where is BJ? And she's, like, oh, at his parents' anniversary dinner. And he's, like, where? And she tells him, and then he takes her to BJ, which is literally the hottest thing Tom England has ever done. One of the hottest things that anyone has ever done in this entire book is that when Magnolia, like, really, she's, like, this, like, really has shaken Magnolia. She's kind of, like, in shock a little bit. He takes her to the person that she needs. He's, like, this girl doesn't need me. She needs BJ in this moment. And he, like, texts BJ ahead to, like, let him know that they're coming. And BJ is waiting outside of, like, the hotel when they show up. And Magnolia immediately goes to him and is, like, you're being held by him. And Tom kind of explains what happened. And he's also, like, also, I'm coming with you guys on the little trip. Also, I can fly us. And BJ's like, we have planes. Everyone has a plane. Okay, you're not special. We all have private jets. And Magnolia's like, yeah, but Tom's the only one who can fly us there. Like, he's a pilot. And BJ's like, anyone could be a pilot. I could be a pilot. I'm going to become a pilot tomorrow. So that's not even that special. Tom is, like, leaving. And he's leaving Magnolia with BJ for the moment while Tom gets, like, everything sorted for the, their trip. And he points to BJ and he says something that I hate more than anything anyone's ever said to me before you look after her. I love this moment because I think it is so honest and indicative of like BJ's relationship with Magnolia. Like this is his girl. They have this like possession of, over each other and for someone to be like look after her 
Like, he's not already doing that. Like, this is not his girl. Upsetting. Infuriating. He can't even stand it. Then they head to Greece. We are headed to this resort in Greece. Magnolia, Tom, BJ, Paley, Perry, Henry, Gus, and Christian are going. Jonah is not on this trip. I don't remember what Jonah's doing. Probably crime. Magnolia has grown, like, really attached to Tom, but she can feel that this, like, fake dating thing is kind of, like, coming to a close. Like, it's kind of outlived its, its need. And she is like, maybe I could just, like, end up with BJ again. Like, maybe I could either end up with BJ or, like, be by myself. She never thinks that. Magnolia has never for a second been like, maybe I should be with myself for a little bit. <laughs> and she's a little bit sad over, like, the Tom thing ending because she likes having him obsessed with her because Magnolia loves having people obsessed with her. And she's, like, she really has started to enjoy spending time with Tom and, like, doesn't want their little thing to end. But it's not over yet because at the place they are obviously sharing a room together. It's her and Tom in the same room and BJ is a little obviously upset about it. He's trying to be, like, a good citizen about it to be honest like bj is sad and he's not immediately like kissing a girl at the bar so like he gets a gold sticker on his sticker chart because he's trying his best and magnolia notices he's trying his best but he's a little sad and she says hey why don't you plan something just for the two of us for tomorrow like why don't you plan just a little one-on-one -on -one date bachelor style for us to go on tomorrow and bj like can't do and loves the fact that magnolia just asked him essentially to go on a date right in front of tom that night it's dinner time they're at dinner and Tom, they're like talking a little bit about like the Marsley Harley thing. They're like, yeah, I guess it kind of explains why you have a nanny, even though you and Bridge are both like full grown adults. And um, Tom is like, yeah, I like, why do you have a nanny if you're 23 years old? And Magnolia is like, first of all, I'm 22, but I think we all know obviously now that the reason I have a nanny is because my dad was sleeping with her. So, but also she was helpful and I, I will miss her. And then we, like, learn a little bit more about Marsley and, like, the the lore of, like, what they what Marsley was like when they were growing up and how she would always take them to McDonald's on, like, weekend nights out and how, like, Jonah had a little bit of a crush on her when he was younger because she's actually, like, really hot and doesn't look like Dorota from Gossip Girl. Even though Dorota from Gossip Girl can get it, obviously. We learn a little bit more about Marsley. And then they start to play a game of Never Have I Ever at the Table. Why? I don't know. These guys are weird, okay? I don't know why you're... These are, like, the oldest friends in their life, and they're like, I know what we should do at this very nice restaurant is play a game of Never Have I Ever. And so they do. And they start, and Perry says, Never Have I Ever... <laughs> I always say this in a YouTube-approved way. Never Have I Ever gotten off in public. And Magnolia doesn't drink, but Chris, the Christian turns to her and is like, You need to drink. Uh, you need to drink, too, actually. And Magnolia's like, No, I don't. And Christian is like, yeah, that one time with you and BJ in Paris. And Magnolia is like, I did not do that. That is so improper. And Christian was like, you didn't seem like you were so worried about whether it was proper or not at the time. And Paley is like, how would you even know what she was doing? Like, how would you know that? And Christian says, because I know what she looks like when she's enjoying herself. Again, we are censoring this a little bit. He's just, like, getting mean. And Magnolia is, like, embarrassed and, like, kind of hurt by what he's saying. And BJ and Tom are kind of getting, like, flustered about it. And so they get up and they go to the bar together. And Tom is, like, asking BJ, like, what the heck is the deal with Christian? And BJ's like, yeah, they dated, like, right after Magnolia broke up with me. Like, her and Christian started dating. It's weird vibes. And then Magnolia comes over and she's clearly, like, a little, a little more flustered than when they even left her. They, like, chat for a second and then Tom takes her back to their room. We do get Christian's perspective on this dinner as, as well. And essentially, Christian is, like, in a bad mood. And he's in a bad mood. And he's decided that he has feelings for Daisy. And, and so just feels like making people mad. And so he intentionally makes Magnolia Parks angry. And he talks about how he likes to make Magnolia angry. Because it's fun to, like, make her angry, get her all riled up. And then just, like, you know, give her a snuggle, kiss her on the forehead, and then make her feel better. Ew, uh, disgusting. Uh, <laughs> and this is the boy we have for Daisy. <laughs> Falling. And then we also learned that after the boys left the table and went to the bar, we didn't see that Christian then called Magnolia a bitch. And Henry had to step in and be like, mm, that's not how we talk to her. And Christian's like, I can talk to her however I want. And Henry's like, mm, not like that. That's not what we do. And then after Magnolia has gone to bed, BJ and Christian kind of like face off. And BJ turns to Christian and says, hey, here's the thing. The thing you and Magnolia had, it was always about me. She only wanted you because she couldn't have me. And then um, Christian is like, he knows this is true. Like, he hears this and he's like, this is clearly true. And he feels like completely, like, kind of like decimated by that. Like, that really hurts his feelings. Good. Hope your feelings were hurt. 
we also get a quick check in with Daisy in Paris. She's still in pa Paris with Romeo, and they are like chatting, and they're in the Hates' home in Paris. They have like a cute little chateau in Paris, and they're hanging out there. And Rome is a little jealous over the flirting that happened with Tiller, even though that's why Daisy was there. It was like her literal part of the job. But he's like, hey, I didn't love that flirting. That didn't feel great. And they have to have a little chat about like what they're doing who they are and Daisy's like mm, we're very casual like I'm sleeping with other people I assumed you were also sleeping with other people like I thought that's kind of what we were doing so I don't know why you're getting so mad about this or like so in a twist about this Tiller thing and Rome is like um honestly it seemed like when we were exclusive that one time you got really mad at me when I slept with Tabby Jukes and Daisy is like that was literally different you know that night of that like now we're not doing that now we are not exclusive and he's like yeah but like things with Christian are like not quite as casual as you're making them out to be like I can tell that you kind of are starting to develop feelings for him like I've known you long enough to to see that and to know that and he's like but I know that it's also a phase <laughs> Romeo like believes in his heart of hearts that they are inevitable that they will end up back together again like Romeo is as deluded as BJ unfortunately I don't think Daisy is as deluded as Magnolia <laughs> poor Rome poor Rome to Greece. Um, then it's the next morning. Magnolia is laying out by the pool in the morning before her little date with BJ and Christian comes over to apologize, but he almost immediately starts getting mean. He's like, sorry about last night, but also you're the worst and you literally use every single person you interact with. Every person you interact with, you're using, you just want to make them fall in love with you and you're the worst and you suck. And Gus steps in and is like, whoa, 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 like stop. <laughs> what are you doing? Could you stop being an absolute a-hole to Magnolia who is just trying to mind her business by the pool? And Christian Christian leaves and then Gus does turn to her and says yeah the thing is like mm, three guys on this trip are completely in love with you so this is seeming a little weird like the only ones that are, aren't is like Henry the Ballantine brother and the two gay guys so I do think you might want to like assess that assess what's happening and Magnolia's like Tom's not in love with me and he's like yeah He's maybe falling in love with you, and you are maybe falling in love with him, and I do think it's gonna get messy, and I do think you guys need to be really careful. He, like, is aware of, like, the fake dating situation, but he's also noticing that things seem to be deteriorating in terms of, like, is this even fake anymore? It's not fake anymore. Time for the date. Remember, Magnolia promised BJ a cutie little one-on-one -on -one date, and BJ has planned for them to go on, like, a yote, a yote a yacht trip around Greece. Sounds gorgeous. So if I wasn't already at Lake Como, this boat trip sounds lovely. Would be in the back, resting, reclining, having a great time on the boat while they bickered in the front, okay? And it starts out, like, gorgeous. They're having, like, such a lovely time. BJ was kind of nervous about it because, like, she's a fancy lady, and so, like, she needs a fancy little date. But it's going super well, and he's like, I feel like the universe is giving me a second chance. He's like, I want to kiss her, but he doesn't want to, like, push things too quickly. He's going to, like, let things simmer. They're having, like, a gorgeous time. They're like, drinking and eating and having just like the loveliest time she's wearing a lilac bikini and that's his favorite color on her and like truly perfection and then magnolia is like hey bj why did you do it asking about the cheating thing and bj is like he can't come up with an answer he's like i don't know and like magnolia just keeps pressing keeps asking she's like i need to know like in order for us to like move forward in order for us to start again i need to understand why it happened because if i understand why it happened i can understand why it won't happen again and he like she like does push for like a while and then finally bj caves in and he says to her because i wanted to why did i cheat on you because i wanted to and that's it that date ruined everything that was happening, the chemistry that was building, all the nice times, out the window. It's over. Magnolia is devastated and says they immediately go back, and BJ is like, ah, my chance for the universe, I threw it in the garbage. Like, it's over. I got another chance, and I effed it up. So Magnolia's upset, BJ's upset, they're back at the hotel. Immediately, Magnolia runs to Tom, and he reali she realizes that he feels safe, that they're that her feelings for Tom are changing. Like, in this moment where, after leaving BJ, she runs to Tom, Tom, she can, like, really feel the change of those feelings and how it's becoming more than a crush and, like, there's some real, like, emotion behind it. And she, like, recognizes the fact that she might love BJ, but he feels, like, really dangerous. He feels so volatile, and, like, he just continues to hurt her again and again, and there's only so many times that she can, like, confidently go back to him. And she says, Do I have feelings for this man, me and Tom? Or has he just been elevated to the number one safest place? Can those two things be mutually exclusive? I don't know. I don't know whether I do. I don't know if they can. I just know then that I feel safer in, safer in his arms than I do out of them. And I know that he smells like a Sunday morning. Slow, easy, uncomplicated, like fresh coffee. 
new towels in a light flooded room. Oak moss, patchouli, bergamot, lavender. And if Tom smells like a Sunday morning, then BJ smells like a Saturday night spent in the emergency room. Don't think of BJ. And I just would love to not be in the emergency room anymore. Tom nods, says toward, Tom nods his head toward the door. I'll buy you a drink. I give him a small smile. Buy me several. Yeah, this idea that like, that like Tom is, there's like an easiness to Tom. There's like an ease to Tom that there isn't with BJ. That BJ is this like volatile fun, but like isn't steady and stable in the way that Tom is. So anyway, they go down to the bar and they are like having drinks. And then all of a sudden a very, very drunk BJ stumbles into the bar and he's immediately being mean. Like he is just like immediately mean. And Christian and Tom are trying to like diffuse the situation a little bit, but BJ and Magnolia are like fighting, like inches away from each other, like yelling, screaming in each other's faces, calling each other names, just being like horrible to each other. And like BJ like just keeps escalating. Remember, BJ's move when he feels like things are going poorly is to go, what is the worst possible choice I can make in this moment? And then to make that choice. And that is what he's doing in this moment. And they're both like claiming that they're like completely done with each other's BS. They like don't want to deal with it anymore. They can't tolerate it anymore. Then BJ says to her, what the F are you doing Parks? Like, what are you doing with him, with every boy before? And Magnolia just goes to him and she says, oh, I'm just doing what I want. Like using those words that he just like said to her back against him. And then Tom is like, okay, actually we're done. And Tom like steps in front of Magnolia and Magnolia thinks like, this is the first time anyone has ever had to shield her from BJ. In that moment, that's what Tom was doing. And they, and they leave together. And we do get Christian's POV of this instance. Um, we go back a little bit in time and we realize that like, he essentially spent his day dwelling on the fact that Magnolia like loved him in the past. <laughs> he's like, she did love me at one point, but he just feel, like, feels like Daisy is this, and he's thinking about Daisy, obviously. And he feels like Daisy is too easy she feels like this distraction he like compares her to like floating in a pool and like putting your head underwater so you can't hear the sounds anymore like there's this like ease to him in a similar way that there's an ease to tom for your magnolia i think um and it just feels like too shallow he like is missing that volatility he has with magnolia because magnolia he says to himself i hate her as much as i love her and he's like angry and it like stirs up so much emotion in him where daisy feels so easy that he's like my feelings for Magnolia must be more like true and important because they are like so volatile and so emotional. Um, and then we get the recounting of this big fight and he talks about just like how ugly and toxic it, toxic it is and how they are just both acting like the worst versions of themselves. And we find out that immediately after Magnolia leaves, BJ goes and gets high and Christian then leaves. Christian does not want to stick around for hi BJ because hi BJ isn't great which we will see in just a second because we get BJ's perspective and BJ is like so out of it. He like winds up after the fight, he winds up back in his bedroom and he goes to his uh, bag and he pulls out some Coke, does a couple lines of Coke. Oh, so he comes back downstairs. Henry and Christian are like, Hey, are you okay? Are you cool? And BJ's like, I'm fine. We fight all the time. And Henry is like, not like that. That was like literally the worst fight I've ever seen you in. Like you've been in love with that girl since you were six years old and you just like, ripped into each other are you sure you're fine and he's like yeah 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 and christian's like oh he's high like he's high and he immediately starts kind of like getting mean and defensive and so both christian and henry wind up leaving and so he bj pretty quickly decides that like mm, time to make even worse decisions he's like okay what can i do next that would make this even worse and he says ah i know i will sleep with this bartender and so he is chatting this bartender and oh like very quickly like within a page he is has her in the hallway and they're literally like cooking up in the hallway and while they're hooking up in the hallway, Magnolia comes back downstairs, sees them, runs off. BJ is, like, trying to chase after her, but Magnolia has always been faster than BJ. She hates running. She, like, doesn't like it. Not her vibe, okay? But she's fast. She has long legs. Then we get that, from, that scene from Magnolia's perspective. Apparently, she had these, like, really expensive hairpins, and she decides to be a responsible girl and go downstairs and retrieve them. And as soon as she gets downstairs, she sees BJ and this bartender, like, hooking up in the hallway. Like, you know, like, BJ's pants are down sort of situation and it is traumatizing she runs from bj she runs immediately back to tom she's like sobbing and they sleep together for the first time and this is the first time she slept with anyone since bj and she spends the whole time thinking about bj this sec the whole section i could read you like literal pages from this section it's gorge 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 i'm gonna read you a, a bit but it's one it's probably my favorite like chunk in the book my favorite like long passage and all this shit pulls a number on me because my mind just keeps drifting to bj like, my heart is tethered there, and I wonder if Tom's mind is drifting to Clara. And I wonder what the F we're doing, even if it's too late to stop. I can't stop. 
I'm thinking about BJ's mouth when he talks because the way his lips move is like some sort of ancient wordless poetry. I'm thinking about his face in the sunlight, the gold flecks in his green eyes. I'm counting the tattoos BJ has on his body that no one really gets to see because they're fairly hidden, but most of them are overtly about me. A magnolia, chest. My birth year, inner elbow crease, right arm. His birth year, next to mine. National Geographic, down his forearm. My back begins to arch. A B, left hand. Another B, right shoulder. The Uno reverse card, left calf. A deer, left arm. Tom presses my hand into the bed. Billy, along a rib, left side. A beach umbrella. Left upper arm. Coordinates from Dartmouth. Inner elbow crease, left arm. The date we first kissed, along his left thumb. My breath is fast. Soon I'll lose it. A lilac, left middle finger. The date we first slept together, left forearm. In every lovely summer's day, right forearm. If someone loves a flower, right forearm. Tom pushes in deeper, my breaths turn jagged. A plaster, upper left thigh. Forget me not, right thumb. East winds, chest. Tom's neck arches the way that BJ's did with that girl in the corridor. Paddington bear, right arm. The Maserati M, right foot. BJ's 22nd tattoo, the DeLorean from Back to the Future. What have I done? I love when we get the recounting of his tattoos. My personal favorite, thank you so much for asking, is actually the date that they first kissed tattooed on his thumb. <laughs> okay, we're back. I'm sorry the lighting is probably worse in this situation. Um, I'm in the same outfit, but it is many, many days later from the last time you saw me. And the camera is crook. The sun is like shining in a not entirely flattering way on my face. And that's what it's doing. And that's its business and we cannot stop it. Next chapter we cut to BJ. And BJ at two o'clock in the morning gets a little knock and a knock on his door. And he opens the door and it's Magnolia in tears. And he's like, whoa, what happened? And he's like holding her. Like, Are you okay? Like what happened? And she doesn't even need to respond. And he like knows. She's, he's like, I don't know if it was like, she smelled like him or if it was just like the way she looked but like I could just tell that like she slept with him and like that is what happened and he just feels this like huge like sinking feeling in his chest and he has this moment of empathy in which he's like oh is this how I've been making Magnolia feel for all these years have I been making Magnolia feel the way I feel in this current moment that's kind of yucky after this like after he's come to this realization he's like are you okay and like they both know that each other know they did some like you know mind speaky to each other and magnolia just goes i'm sorry and bj says i'm sorry too and magnolia then goes i hate you and he goes i kind of hate me too but then and like you kind of think they're having like a moment you're like okay maybe they have like finally come to a moment where they can get back together maybe this is that but then bj's door opens from behind him because remember they're like in this hotel hallway and the bartender the woman he was hooking up with in that hallway walks out baxter and james ballantine my love my sweet baby angel my dumb, dumb little nugget. What were you thinking? What were you thinking? Anyway, Magnolia runs away, obviously. She's like, oh no, I was coming back to BJ and like, that was a mistake. He's still up to the same crap he's been up to this whole book. And Magnolia then goes to Paley's room and she hangs out with Paley for a couple hours, just like crying. And then she sneaks back into her bed with Tom like very early the next morning and Tom is still like asleep. She was, he was asleep when she left. He's asleep when she got back. And so for a second, she's like, maybe he didn't even notice I was gone. But like immediately upon awakening in the morning, Tom's like, Hey, did you leave in the middle of the night to go see BJ? Like Tom is not an idiot. And so he is uh, very well aware that Magnolia left in the middle of the night to go sneak out and see BJ. Magnolia explains that she's never slept with anyone besides BJ. And Tom's like, literally wish you would have mentioned that because that may have changed things slightly. And Magnolia's like, yeah, I didn't mention it because I knew if I said that to you, you wouldn't sleep with me. Like, I knew that would, like, end things between us. And I didn't want that, okay? I knew what I was doing, sort of. And so I wanted to proceed as I planned. And um, <laughs> Tom was like, okay, you're right. I wouldn't have slept with you if I had known you hadn't slept with anyone since BJ. And then Tom starts talking about how BJ and Magnolia remind him so much of Sam, his brother, and Clara, because they're just, like, so tangled up in each other. They, like, grew up together in this way that has just, like, tangled them together in a way that feels rather inseparable. And they start chatting about what's next, because Magnolia wants to keep seeing each other. She, like, especially after this, like, big, this brutal blow from BJ, she knows that, like, she can't handle being alone in these moments. Like, she needs a foxhole still. And Tom's like, okay, we can see, keep seeing each other, but, like, maybe we shouldn't sleep together anymore. Like, that seems like it might be a bad idea. 
right? And Magnolia's like, I mean, like, maybe. But, like, I kind of would like to. They are leaving that day, luckily. Thank goodness. Or maybe that they weren't planning on leaving, but, like, this was, like, an emergency exit situation. I don't know. They're all loading on the plane later that morning. Remember, Tom is flying the plane because he's a pilot. He's Pilot Tom. They're all getting on. BJ's trying to talk to Magnolia, and Magnolia's like, I don't want to talk to you, sir. I want nothing to do with you. And then she spends the whole flight sitting up in the cockpit with Tom, and BJ's in the back. He's, like, saved her a seat. At every table, he has saved her a seat, including on this plane. And, um, she's not there. Like, she doesn't come back. And on the way there, like, he had saved her a seat, and she, like, sat with him, and it was, like, a flirty little moment. No flirty little moment. And he's like, oop. Yikes. And he just like watches them interact, her Tom and Magnolia, and he's like, oh, they're actually like a real couple. Feels very real and feels different than the guys that she's been with before. And then we get some text messages at the end of this chapter between Christian and Magnolia, and Christian's like, you could have come to me with all of this, you know? Ew, go home, Christian. Leave Magnolia alone. I know Magnolia, like, I understand that <laughs> um, both of them are to blame in this situation. Both Magnolia and Christian are to blame in this situation. But, like, Christian needs to extract Christian's self for Christian's own good, you know? Like, Magnolia is only benefiting from this situation. Should she be a better person and let him go? Yeah. Is she going to? Then we flash over to Julian and Daisy. They've re just returned from Paris. Because remember, the box set was in Greece. Julian and Daisy and stuff were in Paris doing some recon for a little art thievery they're planning later. And he comes to check on her. And Roman and Daisy were kind of like flirty vibes in Paris. And he's like, hey, Daisy. Julian comes in. And it's like, hey, Daisy, if you want to be with Romeo, you can. You're welcome. She's like a 22-year-old lady, but all right. And Julian's like, maybe we shouldn't even have broken them up. And she's like, he's like, but there was that, that night at the hotel was just like this straw that like pushed us over the edge. And we will get more details on the, the night at the hotel in a moment. But he like thinks back to this like massive moment, the moment that he decided that Romeo and Daisy couldn't be together, which was this night at a hotel, a night where she almost died. This is Julian like kind of thinking about his relationship with Daisy and Daisy's relationship with Romeo and kind of uh, just Daisy as a whole. I know me and her have a weird relationship, somewhere between my sister, my kid, and my best friend. She might be all of the above, but of all the things she is to me, she is absolutely and irrevocably my way home. The way I can tell, right from wrong, good from bad, if Daisy likes someone, they're worth your time. If she doesn't, they can take a hike. Her instincts are insane, and I want to say it's innate, but it might be learned, and then sharpened from all the times people tried to kill or kidnap her. She didn't run away with him. Stayed home with me instead. Um, she's like, he's reflecting back on the fact that, we'll, we'll see this from Daisy's perspective at some point. She'll talk about this a little bit more. But Rome offered, like, wanted Daisy to run with him, to, to leave with her, and she refused. She said, no, I want to stay with my brother. Ugh, I just, like, love, I love the relationship between Daisy and Julian and the fact that he calls her his way back home. And then, so, Daisy and Christian are talking, and then Daisy says, I actually am kind of in love with Christian. So, like, I don't want to get back together with Rome because I'm sort of in love with Christian. And, like, why, girly? <laughs> I just, I truly don't understand Christian and Daisy together. <laughs> She's just, like, talking with Julian about it. And Julian is like, yeah, this could be, like, a phase. Like, Christian could just be, like, a phase. A temporary, like, crush that you have in your life. Or he could be the love in your life. Like, clearly this is something different than what you had from Rome. So either this is something that is, like, gonna burn fast and hot and you're gonna get over it really quickly. Or this is, like, a big deal. This is, like, a life-changing love. Regardless, like, probably don't sleep with Romeo for a little bit. Like, he is deeply, madly in love with you. So, like, until you sort out your stuff with Christian... Leave the poor boy alone, okay? Please stop giving him mixed messages. It's rude. And now Christian's back in town. Remember, they took their Greece trip back, and um, Joe wasn't at the Greece trip. He had, I don't remember what Joe was doing. Jo anyway, Jonah didn't go to Greece. And so they're, like, sitting down for breakfast. Everyone's, like, chatting. Joe's like, how was Greece? What, did, what happened? And Henry's like, yeah, BJ's using drugs again. So that's what happened. And Joe's like, okay, um, we're going to table that, and you and me. BJ are going to chat about that later. Okay. And then he's like, okay, what about you, Christian? What's the deal with like you and everything that's going on? What's the deal with you and Daisy? And Henry's like, also he's in love with him. Henry is just ratting everyone out. He's like, here's the deal with everyone, Jonah. I'll tell you because I'm watching and these guys are idiots. So I will help you out. And Jonah's like, um, that's so interesting because Julian's saying that she, like, her and Romeo are kind of, like, maybe back on. They're getting, like, really touchy. And Christian is like, I probably should fight Romeo, actually. That 
think now that you mention it I think I maybe need to fight Romeo and Henry's like yeah that's definitely the course of action you should do like definitely you need to like joust him for her hand like what are you talking about like that's not what we do my friends and Christian's like right 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 and then BJ is like maybe you should just talk to her maybe you should just tell her <laughs> and Christian thinks to himself BJ has not the greatest qualifications when it comes to giving advice like he's kind of a hot mess so maybe I should listen to him but honestly BJ is very good at giving advice can he take his own advice absolutely not no 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 but BJ like does know what should happen even if he cannot make himself make it happen a few days later, Daisy's going out on the town. Daisy's going to the club with Jack, her best friend, and obviously she looks gorgeous. She's stunning girly. And she immediately spots Christian on the other side of the club, surrounded by, like, a gaggle of girls. Surrounded by a gaggle of girls. Remember, they, like, they don't know what they are right now. They don't know what they are right now. And so Daisy, like, extracts. She's like, okay, I can't focus on Christian because, like, what is he doing? I can't let my life revolve around him. Okay. In this moment and she goes over and she's like chatting with henry and henry has tara sex with him and she, henry introduces daisy and tara for the first time and they like meet and like kind of like talk to each other a little bit and then tara says to daisy i was warned you weren't warm but this is an another level what is your deal like daisy is being hostile which is kind of daisy's ml she definitely has like resting bitch personality which is something that happens to people, okay? As someone who is often, people are like, oh my gosh, I thought you were so mean when I first met you. And it turns out you're not. Okay. And then <laughs> Tara asks her, she's like, was your mom mean or something? And Daisy says, yeah, she was very mean. And then they talk about Tara having slept with literally all the boys except Henry, but she like lit, but she really likes Henry and she like wants to sleep with him. And like, I am so sorry, Jessa Hastings. I just never cared one single iota about the Henry, Tara, Jonah situation. I know some people love it. Some people are like, oh my gosh, are we going to get books from like Henry and Jonah's perspective on this like Tara situation? And I'm like, I don't need it. I like, mm -hmm. I don't know. And then maybe it's because we like meet Tara in Magnolia's perspective and Magnolia is like such a Tara hater that I'm like, yeah, I'm also a Tara hater. Even though Tara has truly not done anything wrong <laughs> as we will come to find out but like Tara really did nothing wrong she just became like the object of Magnolia's ire for no reason and then Daisy goes over to BJ and she's chatting with BJ and she immediately clocks that BJ is high and she notes that that's not like super typical of him um but like whatever like she's around people who do a lot of drugs okay she is and BJ's like hey um Christian is in love with you just so you know and Daisy's like, LOL, that's so funny. He's like literally sleeping with other people. Look at him over there right now. He's like got 27 girls around him. So I don't know if he's in love with me. That's a, way, a weird way to behave. And BJ says, I spent the last three years sleeping with other people because I'm in love with Magnolia Parks. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you that um, just because he's sleeping with other people doesn't mean he's not deeply in love with you. I should know. I'm the literal king of it. And then he goes on to say, he doesn't talk about sleeping with you. We talk about all the girls we sleep with. You know, that's gross behavior. But he never speaks about you because in the same way that I never talk about Parks. In the same way that I never talk about Parks. And Daisy's like, why? And BJ goes, because she's mine. Like, she's not something that I share with the group. And then we get a little a little thought from Miss, Miss Days. And she says... He gives me a small smile that even though it's not about me or for me, my heart thumps like a maniac anyway because I'm a sucker for romance. And I love love. And Magnolia Parks is a f***ing idiot if she doesn't pick BJ Valentine. But if she doesn't, then great. Then maybe I'll have a crack because that smile is perfect. I love that Daisy is a Magnolia BJ stan. I feel like everyone is. Everyone who is anyone is a Magnolia BJ stan, except Marsley, but she is a hater to her core. Marsley's not a Magnolia BJ stan, and honestly, Ma Magnolia BJs aren't, aren't always Magnolia BJ stans, okay? Besides them, everyone's there. Then, we have this incident happen in the club in which Jack gets called a slur. Like, some guys start yelling at Jack. Remember, D Jack and Daisy are there together, but, like, she's been talking with BJ. She hears the guys yelling at Jack. She goes over there. They start calling him names. You remember, he's a gay man. They call him a slur. And BJ is, like, ready to fight the guy because BJ is a good gentleman. But Daisy steps in and just socks the guy that called uh, Jack a name right in the nose. She breaks his nose. And then the friend that was with the bad, the bad guys that were calling Jack names... One of them, she breaks one of their nose, and then the other one that was with him goes for Daisy and goes to, like, grab her. But Christian steps in and is like, you never touch her. Never. Try it again, and I will kill you myself. And then Christian pulls her out of the club. He, like, takes her out of the club and starts yelling at her for putting herself in danger. And Christian was like, you should have come and got me. You shouldn't have started fighting this guy. Daisy's like, why would I come get you? You were over on the other side of the club with a gaggle of girls around you. Why would I interrupt that and be like, excuse me, I so, sorry you saw you were like making out with a girl over here. Could you help me on this side of the club? Like, 
obviously we're not at that level. And then um, Jack comes out of the club and they all, not Christian, Jack and Daisy climb into the car with Miguel and leave Christian behind. Daisy's like, mm -mm, that's not what we are. I need you to like solidify yourself if you're going to ask that of me. I can't trust you at that level unless you provide me some reasoning to do so. Then we get Christian's perspective on that night and, and he's like a dummy dumb head. Dumb dumb baby dumb dumb head. Is he dumber? If we had to rank the dumbness of these people, it like really varies. But in this moment, Christian is number one. BJ's number two. BJ normally likes to be number one, but he's number two for just a second here. And he wanted to tell Daisy he wants to be exclusive the moment she walks into the club. But then he does it, and instead he's kissing Vanna White. Vanna White, not Vanna White. Vanna White is from Wheel of Fortune. Vanna Ripley in the corner. Right? And then we have the whole incident with the club happen in which she, like, has that fight with Daisy out on the sidewalk. And so then he's like, okay, fine, I'm going to just take Vanna Ripley home. And so he, like, picks, <laughs> he doesn't pick her up. He, like, physically does not lift her. Um, him and Vanna get in his car, they drive home. And then, like, ten minutes into the drive, he's like, I don't want her, actually. Actually, I do not want her. And he drops her back at her house and then heads to Daisy's house. And Daisy is, like, alone in her room. She came home from the club. Now she's going to bed. <laughs> okay? And Christian comes in and is like, hey, what's the deal with Romeo? And Daisy's like, not really your business. Like, remember, we're, we don't do jealous. Like, stay, not really your business. And Christian's like, I only want to be with you. Okay? He's like, this is it. This is it for me. It's just you and me. I only want to be with you. And so they're official, official, exclusive. It's exciting. Pop it on the timeline. Actually, we add a few things to the timeline. We're going to add Farnham House when Magnolia finds out that her and Nanny, Marsley, and her father are sleeping together. We'll have pop that up. Um, you know what? We'll go ahead and pop their relationship up on the timeline because they've been sleeping together for like three years. Crazy. And then we're going to add Greece as like a little event because that was a major event because Greece includes when she almost got back together with BJ and then also did sleep with Tom. And then for Daisy, we're going to add her and Romeo hooking up again for the first time and um, the exclusivity of her and Christian because they have been like seeing each other. There was no gap in, like, their relationship, really. They had a couple fights, but no, like, real true gap. But now we're going to, like, make it a slightly darker shade. Which means this little, like, nugget with Rome is going to end. Okay, great. Thank you for playing. Magnolia is also back from Greece. Obviously, they all took the same plane home. And we get a little, like, a recap of what happened with her and Tom in the, the cockpit. It was just, like, mostly flirty vibes, and it was really fun. And then her and Tom made out for a while, which seems unsafe since Tom is the pilot of the plane. I, like, understand that planes don't need, like, that much, like finagling when you're like just like flying through the air but like still I would like you to be fully focused on the plane and not on your girlfriend if you were flying me personally but I was not on this flight again I'm still back at Lake Como where I live now so it was really truly not my problem it's just like it is really flirty and fun and like it just feels like good vibes it like feels so much lighter than her time with BJ when Magdalena arrives back home there's a moving truck out front Marsley, who lives in their house already, is just, like, moving up into Harley's room. And then Ari, Magnolia's mom, is moving out of the house. Okay, the moving truck makes sense. She's moving, like, across the street. Like, she's not moving far. I guess we still need a moving truck to, like, put her crap in to, like, move it down the, down the road. But, like, that's what's happening. Magnolia comes home to this whole situation. She's still, Magnolia's still obviously, like, very upset about everything that happened with Marsley and finding out that, she, like, about this huge betrayal, betrayal as she feels it. She, like, gets really mad and she says to Harley, you cheat. I know you do, but with her, who is ours, our one grown-up who loved us and cared for us and raised us, you had to ruin her. And we get a little bit more. There's, like, a lot of layers to Magnolia's hurt over this Marsley situation, but one of them is because Marsley was just, like, felt like this adult that, like, was obligated to, like, love and care for her and Bridget and, like, to prioritize them. Marsley was this woman that was, like, was just Bridget and Magnolia's, and to have Harley, like, ruin her just, like, really hurts. And in addition to the betrayal on Marcy's level, um, on, like, the cheating and BJ stuff. Then a few days pass. Mar Magnolia is kind of, like, settled back into her rhythms and things. And BJ shows up at Magnolia's house to, like, chat with her. It's been a few days post Greece. He hope thing hopes things has mellowed because, obviously, they left things on kind of, like, a rocky point in their relationship. And he's, like, ready to chat with her. And he comes into the room, and Bridget and Magnolia are in the room. I think they're, like, picking dresses, probably. I feel like that's what they mostly do. And, like, the vibes are a little bit, like, weird and tense. And Magnolia almost immediately kicks Bridget out. She's like, goodbye, you don't need to be here. And then BJ comes over and is like, Magnolia, what is going on with us? Like, what is the deal between us? This is not what we do. And Magnolia is like, you're withholding information from me. BJ is like, I'm not. I gave you my answer. And Magnolia says, okay, if that's your answer, then we're done. Like, I can't, I can't live with that answer. And BJ is like, you don't mean that. And Magnolia's like, no, I don't. And I hate you for that. 
and she's like crying and it's like breaking his heart because every time Magnolia cries it like shatters BJ because he's a fragile fragile boy <laughs> and then BJ leaves and like they're still at this point they like have no solution they're kind of in the same place that they were when they left Greece where it's just like if this is your answer then like what do we do from here but also we can't leave this in the past like neither of them are ready ready to be like okay then maybe this isn't gonna work you know so they're kind of at a weird spot <laughs> few days later Magnolia comes home from work and by work she means just like going out to lunch and having like a cute giggly little time she comes home and Tom is teaching both Bridget and Paley how to make martinis and it's just like this really it's like a pretty short little chapter and it's just like this sweet little scene um about how like Tom fits so beautifully into her life like he really does effortlessly effortlessly fit into her life she like never has to worry about him there's this level of like comfortability with him that she just never had with BJ she had a different sort of comfortability with BJ in which when they were alone together like nothing nothing was ever broken but like walking into the house when BJ she would never wish her what she would find you know there's this the sense that like Tom is just like there's an ease an ease to life with Tom that she never really found with BJ and he then asked her to come to Clara's birthday dinner so for some foxhole duties so that will be coming up soon meanwhile BJ is not doing well <laughs> shocking Magnolia is not in love with him in the act I mean she is in love with him she's always in love with him Magnolia is not currently like hanging out with him so like obviously he is not doing well He's down bad crying at the gym. Just kidding. We wish he was down bad crying at the gym. No, he is like high as a kite, hot mess, sleeping through everyone in the world, um, as he does. And so he's like, he's also drunk. Like, he's drinking, doing drugs. It's like, truly, like, could he be making worse choices? Yes, he will. Don't even worry about it. He will make some worse choices in this book. But he is just, like, falling apart because he hurt Magnolia. Okay? This is his self-destruct button. He loves to use it and Jonah comes up to him and he's like hey Jonah hey BJ, what's going on and BJ's like she's with Tom like she is with Tom in like a very we real way and Jonah's like yeah like look at you <laughs> not to be rude but like I would also be with Tom if these were my two choices and um then Jonah turns to him and he's like okay here's the deal you need to just like go kiss her you need to kiss her. Like, that's how you're going to fix this, is if you go and kiss her. Like, that'll just make, that'll sort everything out. Stop trying to talk things out. And just kiss her on the mouth. Okay, Jonah. Mm. Mm. That's interesting advice. Is it the best advice? I don't, I don't know. He's certainly, we've gotten worse advice before. So, we can't be too mad. Meanwhile, over in Crime World, Julianne is in Germany with the, a bunch of the boys doing some arms dealing light arms dealing you know as one does <laughs> it's a large part of julian's job and so occasionally he does have to go do some arms deals okay that's how he keeps food on the table and gucci on his body They're chatting about the plan for the heist that's happening they're stealing that clip for ezra brown shortly and so they're like chatting about the plan and declan starts talking about tiller and how he has a crush on daisy and that gives julian an idea Okay, <laughs> then we go check on Miss Daisy, and Miss Daisy, it, meanwhile, is back in London. She's all by her, I mean, she's not by herself, I'm sure Miguel is there, and also probably some other security people. She is back in London, though, and it's just, like, a normal day for her, chilling, except Christian and her have, like, been made exclusive, right? They're exclusive now, and Christian is taking her on, like, a proper date. And so she's gotten all dressed up, she looks very fancy, and she's so excited, and then Christian walks in the door, and she's like, um, I thought we were going on a date, and he's like, we are going on a date. And she's like, we are dressed drastically differently. So, and he's like, yes, you are very overdressed. You need to go change. And she's like a little disappointed. Like, she's like, okay, well, if he doesn't want me to be dressed up, like, what kind of date is he taking me on? And then he, like, he plans this whole day. Because remember, Daisy's, like, dream, her aspiration for life is just to, like, be a normal girl, living a normal life. And he takes her on this date that is just, like, a perfect normal day. They go to the gas station and, like, fill up the car <laughs> with gas. And then they go to Ikea. This is the moment in which I am the most on Team Christian. Because he's just really listened to Daisy and taken her on something that, like, he thinks she would love. And then he takes her to a laundromat. He's, like, closed down the whole laundromat. They have the laundromat to themselves. And it is just, like, so sweet. 
and it's just like pages and pages about how she is so deeply and madly in love with this boy. His hands are on my face and then in my hair and he's leaning over me and he's kissing me in this way that feels like a ship breaking through the fog. It's fresh water, clear skies, smooth sailing, birds chirping. The planets of us are aligning out there like our bodies are in here. And I undo the top button of his jeans and he smiles against my mouth. I think I understand for a fleeting moment why everything that's bad and painful and sad is worth it if you love someone. Because I'll remember how he's looking at me forever. The feeling of him is my favorite feeling in the world. For all of his history, all of time, write it down, ring the town bell, and tell the scribes. I'll wear, I'll wear my heart on my sleeve forever that I love him. Like, it's just like pages of her saying stuff like that. It's very sweet. It's very sweet, okay? It's very spoony. It's very sweet. What do you want from me? Like, occasionally Christian does do something right. Thank goodness. He passes, and like, Christian and Daisy have been just like together. Together since they decided they were exclusive. Christian describes it as like they've been in each other's pockets since that like date together. They like spend most of the time at Daisy's house because it's easier because of security reasons and they just like are together in this like really a sweet soft gentle way that they haven't experienced before and it's it is nice. Unfortunately it does not last but it is nice for now and they're lounging on the couch but then Daisy asks Christian if he's killed anyone keeping it real light. He, she really likes to keep a conversation light and Christian's like yeah you and Daisy's like yeah and Christian asks her how many people she's killed, and he, Daisy says, just the guys that were trying to kill me. And then Christian confesses, I just got into a fight, I got into a fight. And then again, we get this vague story of Christian murdering someone, and I just feel, this like really has not, it comes up, it's like mentioned enough, where I feel like Jess is gonna bring it back. We have two more Daisy books coming, and we haven't gotten, sorry, this is like, a non I don't know if this is a spoiler or not, we haven't really gotten resolution, I feel like, on this fight situation, and I feel like it must come back. I feel like it must come back because Christian likes to drop this as like, yeah, one time I murdered a guy on accident. Anyway, they're like chatting about people they've murdered, just like really sweet, swooning conversation. When all of a sudden Declan comes in the house and he's shouting for Daisy. He's like yelling for her. And Julian comes in completely covered in blood and Daisy's mad. Christian's like, mm, she doesn't seem worried. She seems mad because it turns out Julian likes to go to fight nights where he just like fights people for fun. And Daisy thinks this is stupid because someone is going to end up killing him. And in this situation, he won the fight, but then afterwards, the guy got mad, took a glass bottle, and stabbed him with it. Um, and so he's, like, bleeding pretty profusely, has glass all over him, and <laughs> Daisy is going to have to, like, pull the glass out and stitch him up, and she's doing it. Um, and Julian's like, can I please have some local anesthetic? And she's like, no, absolutely not. You want to fight like a man? You could get sutures like a man without local anesthetic, LOL whatever and so she's busy like stitching him up and she was like remember lounging on the couch with Christian and she was just like in a big t-shirt and like underwear and um Christian catches Declan like looking at her butt while she's like giving her brother stitches and Christian gets mad and then shoves him and then grabs Daisy and like puts her behind him and Christian says to Declan you look at her like that again and I will kill you on the spot and Julian is like good work <laughs> Julian he's like finally earning some Julian approval because Julian's like biggest I would say like requirement for someone dating Daisy is that they will lay down their life for Daisy because he would be willing to lay down his life for Daisy and so anyone who is going to enter into Daisy's life in this capacity better be willing to do the same right like Daisy is the princess Daisy and Christian go back to her room and Christian is like um hey how many of the boys have you slept with Daisy's like a couple of them I mean like a few of them you know how it goes and then Christian decides he's like gonna give Daisy something and he has this like Tiffany heart necklace that says Hemez that that Magnolia got him at some point and he's worn it every single day since Magnolia got it for him and he decides that he's going to take it off and give it to Daisy and so now Daisy has this necklace from Christian from Magnolia he's like re-gifted this necklace I don't know this is a choice is it a great choice I I don't know the vibes are weird with that if I was Daisy I would feel weird about it Christian doesn't seem to think about that though a couple days later, Julian is still recovering from his, like, big incident, which he had also, he's, he has some broken ribs from, too. Didn't mention that. Broken ribs, some sutures, still from the fight night. He's in his office, and he's talking with Romeo and Carmelo, and he's trying to, like, convince them to help him steal the clinch that he's working on because he's sending more guys. He needs a couple more men to come with him because he's sending most of his guys to Paris as, like, a distraction for Interpol. And as they're, like, chatting, Romeo and Carmelo are, like, negotiating how much they're going to get paid, and then Daisy and Christian arrive, and Romeo is there. And he's like, oh, so are you guys official now? Like, Romeo and Hostile vibes, obviously. And Christian's like, I'm not giving her a ring, but yeah, we are. And Romeo's, like, super sad, and he says to them, I give it a month. I think you'll be broken up after a month, which is a mean thing to say, but I don't know. I don't blame Romeo. 
And then Julian's like, enough, I have to do business. Can you guys please stop? I need to like do stuff. He realizes that like this is really bad news because if Romeo and Christian actually like decide to like fight over Daisy, it would not just be a fight between these like two guys. It could potentially like spiral into a whole gang war right? Because the Brambrillos and the Barnes family, which is the Jemez boys, are technically under the Barnes crime family. They, like, could go to toe to them. And it would be bad. It would be really nasty. It wouldn't be great. So he, like, really does have to keep, like, an eye on this situation because it could really spiral into something bad. Okay, that's where we're gonna leave things. We're gonna leave things for now. We have, like, a third of both books left, I think. Yeah. Hopefully one more video. Um, I will try to have the third part out a little bit quicker um, from the series so we can finish up these books and then move into the second books. Okay, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I will talk to you in the next one. Bye.